Hello, everybody. Today I have the opportunity and the pleasure of presenting a real friend, okay? It's true. And a good person and a great researcher. I say great researcher because Sudan has successfully worked in different research lines since he began his PhD, especially in sentiment analysis, argumentation mining, and now in terms of working natural language processing. Currently, he leads his own research group at the uh, Technische Universität Darmstadt on reporting natural language processing. I am besides, okay, I think it's is also important. Sudan has signed to be a musician, uh, and I will not be able to forgive myself to not listen any concert of Sudan. Okay, I'm sorry, Sudan. But I'm sure that his concerts are fantastic. Thanks, Sudan, for accepting the invitation of Kasi Research Institute. Uh, we are ready to listen to you, so you can start whenever you want. So thank you very much, Eugenia, for this invitation. Thank you for the kind, very kind introduction. Um, yeah, I, I do music as well on the side, but mainly I'm, I'm involved in, in quite a lot of research recently. And I'm really happy to, to see Eugenia you again like after quite a long time. So we spent some time at the, um, at the UKP lab in Darmstadt together, um, working on very hard topics with causality, I remember. And uh, I'm happy to see uh, Eugenia in his new role here. So very happy to be here. Um, I'm Ivan, nice to meet you everybody. So uh, if you are, so I don't know how many people are here in the um, in the talk, but most of them are just black boxes to me, which makes it harder. So I'm gonna do the, uh, I'm gonna do the YouTuber style. So I'll be talking like on YouTube. And, but whenever, whenever you have any question, just, you know, stop me, ask questions like directly. And uh, so I would like to be as more, more interactive if it's possible. But you can just only listen that's fine as well so for this topic uh, for the, for for my talk i i'm gonna present something like very uh, very fresh very very new research like something we're baking right now and we have more uh, actually more questions than answers right now so um i hope you'll enjoy it and as i said like anytime just uh, don't write on the chat because i won't be able to to read the chat but just you know uh raise your raise your hand or just ask directly so um the title of this talk is uh, if all you have is a hammer everything looks like a nail and I think this analogy is quite nice because we have some techniques for here for privacy preservation in natural language processing and we might be able to use them you know all over the place but maybe they won't really work so is the hammer, hammer good well let me start with a question you know to you everybody so if I um, if I ask you one question so for example how many of you think that that privacy matters you know, does privacy matter to you? Well, you don't have to answer, but I, I would I would say like the answer would be, of course, yes. I mean, privacy matters. Privacy is super important. I guess it's true somehow to most of us to some extent. So here's another question. Um, if I want to ask you, uh, okay, so let's suppose you were you were my students in my class and I, I would ask you, how many of you cheated an exam? What are you going to say? Well, maybe the answer is not like, you're going to be maybe hesitating, you know, to tell me because you don't know whether you can trust me and, you know, whether I'm the good guy or bad, bad guy. So that's a, that's a hard question to, to learn something about the population. And but what about I really want to know this answer. I really want to know how many students in my class actually cheated and is there a way to find out? And there seems to be a way. So if I'm interested in this question, I want to go your hands raised and uh, I want to figure out how many how many people actually cheated without you know revealing privacy of you how can I do that and there's some very cool mechanism going back to actually to the 1960s from some uh, I think Stephen Warner or Stephen Warner and it's called randomized response and it's a it's a very nice exercise so you want, you might want to try out if, if you haven't heard of that it's a it's a really cool first um, so to say uh, first touches of privacy. So it goes like that. You take a coin, like a Euro coin, and you toss a coin. And if it comes heads, you tell me the truth. So I cheated, I didn't cheat. If it comes tails, then you take a coin again and toss again. And then you're gonna tell me the answer depending on the outcome. So then it will be randomized basically. You will tell me I cheated if the second cost, uh, second toss comes heads and you will say well i didn't cheat if it comes tails 
So basically, there will be some some randomization or some some random process in answering the question. And then, so if we, if we did it like with one of you, with Eugenio, for example, Eugenio, did you cheat in the exam? And Eugenio just used this this procedure, and he would answer yes. <laughs> you don't have to answer Eugenio, just like hypothetically. And he if he answered well, yes, I cheated. Um, he still has something which we call like uh, the plausible deniability. So because he might say, well, I'm telling you I cheated, but it might just have been the coin. There is some randomness in my answer, right? So, and I don't know whether he really cheated or not. He has some privacy, but here's the thing. If I collect these answers from the entire population, like the whole classroom, 50, 100 people, I could like pretty, pretty good estimate of how many people actually cheated without revealing privacy of any of those people. And this is very nice you know, example of something which we'll define later as, as differential privacy, but basically it's um, putting randomness into some process of uh, answering hard questions. And it's been used since the 60s in the social sciences for asking people, you know, committing crime, taking drugs, and all these hard questions which you don't want to reveal that much about yourself, but somebody's interested in the whole population statistics maybe. So the question is, uh, we know that privacy matters, how privacy matters in NLP? And how can we go from this 1960s randomized response back to the future to something we, which we do care about? Mm. <clears throat> For example, a uh, language model. So let me just ask a question I, I, to be sure that in the audience, like who is in the audience? So if I, if I say like, uh, I don't know, BERT and GPT-2, uh, are you on board? Everybody's happy? Yeah. Okay, great. Sounds great. So we, this is this is great. So there's um, so in the GPT-2 model, as you might know, it's um, it's basically um, a train parameters of a neural network where you, you put a prompt and it will answer something or will generate the output. And if you if you ask wisely, if you put a prompt in a wise way, you can actually reveal more than you want, or maybe it, the model will reveal more than the, the authors of the model want. So Carlene and others um, at this paper, uh, the secret chair and the other papers and, and the paper I'm presenting right here, they asked GPT model some prefix. So for example, East Strasbourg, Strasbourg address. And the model would basically fill the, fill the bank or fill the black or continue with answering uh, real people's names, addresses, uh, maybe even like um, phone numbers, fax numbers. And I guess in some cases, the model actually revealed social security numbers of real people in the database, which is pretty scary because if you think about it, the model was trained uh, by some autoregressive models on uh, learning something about language. So semantics, syntax, maybe pragmatics, name it, generating language, so next token and so stuff like that. But it did remember things it shouldn't remember in the first place. So for example, people and their names and something which is related to privacy. And we don't want this model to remember anything private. We want them to learn something more language. So this is a great example like that, even like in the nowadays, we think like billions of documents so nobody really cares, but even these models, they do remember things that they saw only once maybe. So what can you get, go about it? How can you go about it and what can we uh, improve here? Uh, and how can we bridge this gap from, we know some tools for uh, preserving privacy from the 1960s and we know NLP would definitely benefit from protecting, protecting privacy of some people. So bridging this gap is basically uh, a research agenda of my very small research group. So I've single now single PhD student because basically we just started this year so I have one PhD student but very many um, talented master and bachelor students and in this talk I'm going to talk about some joint work with these uh, master bachelor students and with my uh, PhD student Timur so let's start with some practicity so as I said if you all have a hammer everything looks like a nail and we should look into what we mean by this hammer and what is going to protect and what's the privacy and uh, I guess most of you actually or some of you definitely know differential privacy because I uh, I was reading some papers of um, uh, from your lab or from uh, I was, was uh, definitely involved in one yeah yes uh, even there are 
I say hello. I hope I think he's here. And he's working in um, Defense of Privacy. Danny is here. Nice. <clears throat> but Danny, so I hope you are listening. We are listening. I'm sorry. I do not. I, I can't hear Eugenio properly. I'm sorry. I don't know what he's saying right now. I can hear Ivan perfectly, but I can't hear Eugenio. Eugenio, I'm sorry. Yeah, okay, this microphone is somehow broken. <laughs> but Yuri, okay, great. So there's there's people who know differential privacy even better. If there's people who don't know differential privacy, that's fine as well because I'm I'm gonna like slightly introduce the concept and why we what do we mean by protecting privacy with differential privacy. So um so this is basically like a probabilistic approach to losing privacy. And we have one one example here. <clears throat> Excuse me. Which is, um, so imagine we have a database of three people. So we have A and B and C, and these people, you know, they have some secrets or maybe something which is sensitive. So for example, whether they cheated uh, in exam. And we have here a trusted curator. So this is Elise, uh, it's the trust, trusted curator. It's somebody who the people trust and she knows everything about these people. So this is some somebody trustworthy. Then we have uh, a bad guy, the Bob, who wants to know something about the population here. So for example, how many people cheated and, but he's, he's not being trusted. So we don't, we can't tell him the truth because if he knows the truth about maybe like these two people, he could figure out by the answer, the truth about this person. So we can basically using some side attacks or some background knowledge infer something private or something sensitive about each person. So we don't trust him. So what is Elise going to do is if Bob's asking for how many people cheated in an exam, Elise knows the true answer because she knows all the people. So she's giving back the true answer, but then she'll protect the true answer by adding some randomness. And we're coming back to the randomized response from 1960s where we had this randomness with um, basically probability uh, coin tossing, but here there could be something else. Could be again coin tossing or could be some drawing from some probability distributions, for example. So Elise is protecting people by adding noise. And there's a mathematical formulation of that. Um, and it works like that. If there is one person change in the database, so for example, instead of three people, A, B, C, we have only B and C, the answer, which is, which is given by Elise, the private answer, will change only slightly. So there will be almost, I'm saying almost, no difference in answering the query whether or not one person is in the database. And this is why it's called differential privacy. It's differs in one person, the database, basically. And, and the nice thing about it is it has, um, it has a mathematical description. So there will be some upper bound how much privacy will be lost in the worst case. Mm, if it looks, uh, there will be some formulas they might look scary, but in, in the, at the end of the day, they're, they're kind of simple because we're modeling this noise as a, some probability distribution over database. And we're saying for any two databases neighboring, and by neighboring database, we mean a database when we have, for example, three people and two people. So they differ in one person. For any, any neighboring databases, Whatever comes out from the from the mechanism from the you know from the answer, whatever comes out, whatever answer comes, the differences between these two or the probability of the difference of the probabilities will be bounded by some epsilon. And the epsilon is called the privacy budget. So we exactly know in the worst case, in the worst case for any different setups of the databases, how much privacy we can lose probabilistically. And for example, if you look back on the uh, on the example of uh, randomized response, so, so the, the the coin tossing, the the epsilon, the privacy budget was something about one point one. And the smaller the epsilon, the better the privacy, because the the, the less indistinguishable are the os, are these outputs. The bigger the epsilon, the lower the privacy. Of course, privacy comes with a price, as we will see later on. So, um, any questions to this so far? Um, any questions? 
I see maybe something in the chat here. Uh, 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 okay, no thanks. <laughs> Great. Okay. So. <laughs> Very good. So let me let me just continue. So this is like you know the fundamentals of differential privacy. There's like much more. This is like very very you know, theoretical, deep sort of theoretical computer science, mathematics, statistics field with lots of very weird mathematics in there as well. But the, the main idea is just you know if you remove one person, the difference will be almost the same. Let's put it like that. Good, so let's have a look at the, the hammer. <laughs> so, you know, the tools in our toolbox we're gonna use uh, for protecting privacy in modern NLP. And this is the um, differential private stochastic gradient descent. So I guess most of you are familiar with training deep neural networks or training you know, any other non-deep network, uh, non-deep models with uh, stochastic gradient descent where you basically iterate through your, through your training data and update the parameters of the network of the model by using some small batches and basically gradient and deprivation. So I'm not gonna explain that, but you might be wondering like uh, why, why differential privacy and stochastic gradient descent. So if you look at the stochastic gradient descent in detail, in, in the, the core of this algorithm is just this one step where you have some parameters uh, at time, time step T. So you're training and you're time step T. And the network has some parameters, uh, a bunch of numbers, basically. It's a just a bunch of weights. And you compute your gradient. So you take your examples, propagate through network, uh, compute your gradients, your errors on the loss. And gradient is, again, like a bunch of numbers. So basically, gradient is a, is a, is a vector of numbers. And you're going to update your, your weights by uh, subtracting the gradient with some learning rate. So this is pretty standard thing, and you know it's core of most of the methods. SGD, Adam, name it, all of these. It's basically updating by gradient. And here comes the the privacy. So we're actually going to add noise somewhere, and we're adding noise to the gradient. And why is that so? I mean, there's there could be different places where we can add noise, but adding noise to the gradient seemed to be like the most beneficial thing. And this looks scary on the first side, but it's not basically. It's saying we're taking the true answer. So this is the, the actual gradient. And this is somebody, you know, so let's say this is our Elise. Elise has access to the, to the network and she knows everything. So she knows the true gradient, for example. And she's going to add some noise to this gradient. And here we're using uh, a Gaussian distribution because it has some properties. Uh, it could be different distributions as well, but the Gaussian, you know, uh, it. it it works well with multiple steps. So there are some properties of that for differential privacy. But basically, the main mechanism is simple. We have some true answer and we're adding some noise. Uh, why, is, why is here this clipping, clipping of the gradient? Because um, the gradient could be any, any real numbers. So basically, you know, it's unbounded. And it's hard to add unlimited noise or infinity noise to unbounded things. So we want to just bound it and make sure that maybe the, all these gradients, they live in some, you know, in some sphere, for example. So if you add noise, you basically cover your whole space. And, and this is it. So we're just basically adding noise to each step. It seems simple. Uh, the trick or the, the, you know, the core question is like, how much noise are we actually adding to make it differential private? So there's a, a lot of theory and I would just point to this, uh, Martin Abadis et al. paper 2016 on learning on uh, differential private stochastic gradient descent. But as I said, we're basically adding in each step of the gradient descent, we're adding the noise and we're making sure that two neighboring data sets, in our case, this would be like two batches of points, one B will have like indistinguishable output in the gradient. And this is basically the hammer we have. So by simple tweaking of the, of the gradient descent, we're just making the network differentially private with some properties of these epsilons. So we are wondering, OK, well, we have this hammer. So how about anything else? What can we actually achieve with these, with these things? I mean, protecting privacy could be anything. So we're interested in uh, using that for language modeling. Um, I mean, some people have tried for language modeling. So for example, um, McNahan in 2018, they, they tried combine um, differential private SGD with federated learning for learning um, language models for maybe like smartphone users. So basically, 
each user would type some messages and you don't want to you don't want to really their privacy so they're going to apply apply differential privacy on on a, on a user so not on a message but on the user level and they're using also federated learning just to you know send the the minimum gradients over a network and uh, to make it like a decentralized system so it was all good for language modeling but you know we're not nlp people don't do only language modeling they do many other things so we're interested in other tasks um, and why so there was one paper this year at a, at a workshop for uh, privacy preserving nlp from uh, abdikiana and chris beeman who was actually who was uh, uh, at Darmstadt as well but now is professor in, in hamburg and they tried um, SGDDP for uh, learning name entities. So if you haven't done name entity recognition, it's very simple. You have a you have a text, and each token is either uh, some entity. So for example, Angela Merkel would be person. So beginning of person, inside person, and then the rest of the tokens would be like outside, or it could be location, maybe numbers and stuff like that. So typical stun, you know, typical um, name entity recognition task. And they try that, they try uh, name recognition on some sensitive data with, again, for the learning and differential privacy. And they use the TensorFlow privacy. And the striking results was that even with super, super, super small epsilons going back to like 0 0.02, so which is almost like perfect privacy, the results didn't change. And we were only like, what's going on? How is that possible? Because what you, you know, you were expect the more noise you're adding, the, the worse the, the performance should go, right? And they were actually like showing the, the results on with decent privacy, three or 0 0.6, still, you know, 90% F square. It's like that's not possible. So let's let's have a look. So we we thought like, okay, let's let's do the survey. Let's actually try different. NLP tasks and you know different setups and different data sets and to, to find out like what's the pattern? I mean, what's the best setup and, and stuff like that. Any questions so far? Okay, it doesn't seem to be the case, so I'm 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 gonna go ahead and show some more nails. So <laughs> what we are having here. <clears throat> Is these tasks? So we're interested in um, different NLP tasks, which are kind of like considered typical or prototypical uh, sentiment analysis. So basically, review whether it's negative or positive. Then we looked into natural language inference, um, for example, the Stanford NLI corpus, where you have um, your text um, and hypothesis, and whether if you can tell whether if it takes the true, the hypothesis holds as well or contradicts. So it's a three way classification. Then we had a name entry recognition as well. So this is what I showed already. And then another like sequence tagging task, which is part of speech tagging. So because we're interested, like, you know, is the issue with sequence tagging or just with a particular name entry recognition data set? So we took part of speech tagging, which is basically, again, labeling each token, whether you know, it's verb, noun, adjective, and so on and so on. And we took also like question answering. And in this case, we do the, the, the particular um uh squat uh, data set the famous one where you say on which positions in the document the answer to the query could be so it's not like answering question with free text but basically saying where can i find an answer in this document any questions to these data set i mean are you familiar with them or have you worked with them maybe i would be curious you know what uh, or is there anything missing would you be interested in Good, great. That's 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 great. That's great. So you will you will recognize some data sets as well. All right. Mm. So we use some very typical setup for you know for nowadays NLP. So the baselines would be a long short term memory with glove word embeddings and of course the, the very famous bird based model as a as a, as the models which will be either train or fine tune on these tasks like the very typical setup in uh, you know in the last two years so to say um and we use also like bidirectional uh, layer on top of uh, birds for some reasons like you know compressing everything into one into one vector from all these embeddings 
So this is something which is very standard. And of course, we now have also different implementations of, um, of this differential private stochastic gradient descent in, in standard framework. So one is Opacus, which goes well with, um, with PyTorch. And it's just basically saying we, I have optimizer, I have model and privacy engine, and we kind of um, just put the parameters of the of the epsilon and delta, which is another parameter for differential privacy. So I didn't say that. Like there's epsilon um, with the privacy budget and delta, which is something some very small cryptographically small value uh, for epsilon delta differential privacy, but it's some very small number. Um, and other things, and we just plug everything together and should work out of box, so, which is great. So we so like, yes, then there's, there's, there can't be any surprises. Though there were many knobs to tune, basically. So if you think about fine tuning bird, so you can fine tune bird in many other, you know, many different ways. So you can fine tune the full bird, you can you know, take something like adapters. So fi fine tuning only just one layer or maybe a couple of layers, then you can fine tune, um, just freeze everything and you know just fine tune the classifier and stuff like that. So we actually were try you know we try everything and we are also interested in different configurations of these epsilon because as I said like the epsilon makes um, makes a huge difference. So the, the the smaller the epsilon, the bigger the noise, and then we expect like less utility. And <laughs> we started with this mystery of this name of the recognition. So we were able to reproduce the results of uh, of the other paper. On this Connell, uh, on this very standard Connell 2003 data set. So the, the standard in MW recognition is this one. And it's still weird. So for if we try like LSTM, uh, we get basically no drop in the performance, even with very small, uh, very small tokens. So we have some intuition why that's so, and exactly right now looking into that, like does it have to do something with the distribution of tokens? But it's very counterintuitive. So it shouldn't be. So either this is like very random baseline, but it's not, or there's something superficial with this data set. Because we tried it with different data sets on for NAR as well, and they work just as expected. So with lower epsilon values, less performance. So this is very interesting, like contraintuitive uh, observation, and we're still working on that to see uh, what's going wrong. And there's also like differences in the implementation. So if you try with Opacus and TensorFlow, you get for this particular data set, you get different results. So I guess the also there's some devil in the detail there. The different frameworks use different uh, approaches to um, there is some numerical optimization, like numerical integration integration, and it can make a difference at the end of the day for very extreme epsilon values like 0 0.02 or 0. Point. So basically you you say like um, how big the noise should be and it computes the epsilon and give you like different epsilons as well. So this is something to pay attention to if you really want to prove okay, my framework is working like that with this epsilon, I can guarantee. There is something to, you know, to be, uh, to pay attention to. Because if you look at other data sets, they behave like just standard. I mean, this is what you expected. So for example, part of speech tagging is just a standard, again, sequence labeling. And then we can see on two different corpora in two different languages, actually, we see like the, the more privacy we're putting, the, the worse the performance is. And with epsilons above 10 or more, I mean, this is like very little privacy uh, preservation, almost no privacy. And we see like there's, yeah, there's a differences in models, but it's interesting to see that some models are more robust to, these, to this noise. And this is exactly what we wanted to show, like what's the best configuration or the best model or the best way of fine tuning the models on these different data sets because nobody has done it before and we are interested in this, surveying this and to see like what would be the best and how, how much actually can we lose in the worst in the best case so um this is like a very ugly table but just to make you know just uh, to summarize there there is no like just one single receipt for all these tasks uh for for privacy of epsilon one for example so epsilon one is quite sort of strong the Privacy guarantees, uh, if you remember the, the randomized response, it was roughly like 1.1. So this is 1.0, should be okay. And we see a drop between um, the, the minimal drop between like zero points, uh, sorry, between seven and 14%, which is which might be bad in some cases, but in some cases it might be actually pretty good because you're actually really protecting privacy of, of, of persons in your data set. And if you work a sensitive data set, you might want to sacrifice some of your accuracy as long as you protect privacy. So there is definitely a trade-off and this could be used for some real downstream tasks. 
the the question is like okay you have to choose vice layer model exactly because they behave differently on different tasks there is some drawback of using differential privacy uh, and this is the runtime so it has to do a lot with the implementations implementations in tensorflow or in uh, in pytorch opacus and tensorflow privacy but it could be like from you know four minutes to six hour uh, sorry from just you know minutes to two hours of of, of runtime and uh, a lot of memory consumption. So this is something to you know pay, pay attention to or be aware of that if you want to do this, maybe on a large scale, there could be some catch. And I'll get back to this point later. So the conclusion of this first part, we surveyed or, or surveyed of these um, different NLP tasks with different models or different yeah different models or approaches to, to fine tuning and found like seven to fourteen percent drop is is okay. Um, it it works. There's some there's still some catches, like for example, the name of the recognition, like what's going on there with these small epsilons. We're still we, we want to find out. And of course, the memory consumption on runtime. But overall, it seems like, well, you know, this hammer really works well for these tasks as well. This is this is cool. We can use it. And the open question is like, well, okay, of course, generate you know, we are talking about classification task. How how will it work with generation task you know like uh, i don't know gpd2 maybe and what's the difference exactly in tensorflow and opacus we really want to find out so these are like open questions and some people are actually working on that already so there's uh, just you know one two months back there's a differential private fine tuning language models paper i guess these people were from either microsoft or google so you know people are actually looking into more so i do see something in the chat let me see, dear PhD students, register attendance. So that's not me, that's good, I, <laughs> I don't have to register. So before I come to the next uh, next part, I would be interested if you have any questions on these, like uh, serving different um, uh, different tasks in NLP with, with privacy. Or what if you have an experience with that, what's your experience? So, uh, hello, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you very bad, but I, I do hear you. Yes. Okay. Maybe now better? Now better, yes. Okay, so my name is Daniel. Uh, Eugenio introduced me a few a few minutes ago. And I was wondering about the delta value that you said for the for the differential privacy analysis that you showed before. Yes. Uh, you, so you're interested in like the actual value or like what it means overall? No, I mean the actual value because you said that you, you you experiment a lot of with epsilon, but I was wondering maybe the fault is with epsilon with with delta or maybe it's something related to that's a, that's that a, that's yeah that's a great point actually. Um, so I I I don't know. I mean I I know I know we fix it. So in these frameworks, you basically fix the you fix the delta and no well the, the, no sorry just one step back so. As far as I know, there uh, these frameworks, the definite TensorFlow privacy is using not this depth, uh, epsilon delta privacy, but it's using um, oh, oh oh yeah the other uh, alpha oh. <laughs> uh, maybe you are thinking about Renji different. Renji exactly yeah thank you I just said it on my own. Mind. Renji it, it's using like uh, you know Renji differential privacy where you have this alpha. And then from this alpha, you can, I mean, the alpha is like better um, somehow comparability from this alpha, you can, for any given delta between zero and one, you can compute the epsilon. So basically it works like backwards. And even like in this, in this frameworks, um, I think it works like you, you set up the, 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 um, the sigma value. So you're basically saying how much noise you're plugging in there and it computes you for the given number of steps and given, you know, parameters of the model, it computes you the epsilons and delta. So there, this is this this is a good point. This this could be um, the delta issue, but I'll, I'll. That's a great point. I I don't know to be honest whether it's you know the culprit is really the delta, but it might be to something to look into that because I remember like we set the deltas to some you know fixed value, but I'm not sure if this is like the same for both frameworks or how how it behaves. What, what's your experience with that, by the way? Uh, well, from what I have learned, uh, sometimes when you fix the noise, uh, you need to provide some delta, and then you, the the framework gives you an epsilon, and if you fix an epsilon and some kind of noise value, it gives you an uh, delta. It's like yeah. if you have one, it gives you the yes, other. yes, yes. Okay, it's a, yeah. it's a relationship like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's, that's correct. In my experience, uh, for what I have seen, I find it shocking that there is no degradation in accuracy. Because in 
in the when you work with images and commute and, and convolutional network and so on you expect a huge drop in, in performance yeah but i find that uh, what you have seen i find that amazing so i was i was wondering about the delta value maybe the, there is an issue there or maybe i don't know maybe uh, it's some problem related to the framework i don't know because i find is yeah, that's yeah, exactly. I mean, that's a great point. So what what I know, like for all these uh, all these main results, the delta was like the standard delta, like uh, one over ten to six or something. Like cryptographic is small, so we you know we're not saying like we have delta of zero point five, absolutely not. But there could be some you know some implications on that on the in the frameworks, like why these frameworks are you know give different results. Then and that's that's a great point. I'll, we'll we'll definitely have a look, look into that. So I'll I'll, I'll tell Manuel about it. So th okay. thanks thanks a lot. Uh, so you're welcome. So I, I, another thing I have found, so there is another framework if you want to experiment. <laughs> there is another one that I have been using to, com uh, to compute the epsilon given some kind of noise um, and the delta parameter. And I can, I'm going to leave it in the chat. Okay, because it that's great. Some really, nice para some really nice papers associated with this framework. And it also gives uh, different values. <laughs> I see. Yeah. So the devil is in the needle. Okay. I'm gonna. Uh, I'm gonna auto DP. Oh, cool. I, I think I've heard his name, but never, never and, really looked into that. And to my my question, um, there is another thing, uh, that uh, some some theorems uh, assume that you are using. Um, some kind of sampling, like uh, some, that you're uh, taking your batches using uh, poison sampling or just uniform sampling or something like that. And this kind of sampling thing, uh, it uh, it impacts a lot in the in the epsilon computations mm -hmm. because if you if you choose uh, just random samples, random mm -hmm. batches, mm -hmm. like like everything, like everyone does. Uh, it, it gives you a uh, bigger epsilons, and if you assume that you are uh, choosing them using a uh, uh, Poisson, mm -hmm. uh, Poisson sampling, it gives you uh, the the epsilon value drops a lot. Mm -hmm. So that should be taken also into consideration when computing. Uh, from what I have read, I think that the TensorFlow Defense Privacy uh, uses the po the Poisson assumption. Oh, okay. Uh, but you can. I have seen the code and I'm not sure. But if you look at uh, if you look at the paper from Abadi in which he presents the DPS SGD, uh, you can see that they assume some kind of uh, poison sampling or something like that, and they oh well we forget we forgot about that and we continue. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's a, that's a great point. I mean, I have another issues with the Abadi paper. Basically, you can't find the code from the original one. So what you see in the, you know, if you look into some older comments of TensorFlow privacy, then you will see something which resembles the original, you know, for example, the moments like implementation is, is a bit different than they had in the paper. So yeah, there, I guess like there's a, some, you know, implicit assumptions there. The Poisson sampling is new to me. So we're basically, we're basically sampling like randomly, I guess, but uh, there's, yeah, that makes sense. So I'll, I'll these are great points. Thanks a lot for that. I, I really appreciate it. Do you want to write a paper with us? <laughs> yeah, sure. Why not? <laughs> drop me a line. Drop me a line. Okay, sounds great. Good. So we're, we're thank we're, you we're, for we're, yeah yeah we're we're short on time yeah yeah definitely. So I'm I'll, I'm jump I'll jump to another another nails now. So because some nails won't fit, that's a problem. So we have this SGDDP and we have this implementations and and the different you know other cool stuff. But what if we want to do something on graphs? So some tasks in NLP are uh, in the form of graphs. So we have notes, which could be like you know article or Reddit post or some personal profile on social media and stuff like that. And then we have edges which connect them. So it could be like citations in in um, uh, uh, citations in um, scientific articles or relationships on networks and uh, attributions and stuff like that. And we have a good hammer for that, which is a uh, graph convolutional networks, basically graph neural networks or one particular implementation is graph convolutional networks. And it has this property is actually like exploiting the, the context, like the, the graph structure. So it, when learning and represent, representation of each node, it's through through this propagation through a network, it basically learns better representation of each node by taking into context uh, the whole graph structure. And it's been shown like, you know, super state of the art results as compared to just single node classification without the, the graph structure. And, <clears throat> 
again, on these models, they had the same issue as other models. They suffer from privacy leakage. So, you know, we could be able, if we are the adversary with super extensive background knowledge and super computational power, we could theoretically, um, you know, infer something about the classes, or we could infer something, you know, membership attacks and, and things like that. Everything we know from, you know, from the attacking uh, frame models. So we we were, we asked like, you know, okay, we have this hammer. Uh, how how the, will it work on graph neural networks? I mean, it should work, but how well it will work on? Excuse me, will it work on graph um, on graph networks? And was a trade-off between again like privacy uh, and the performance on the score. So we collected a couple of various um, tasks for that. So the standard ones would be like citation networks. So you had um, where you have papers citing each other, and you want to classify each paper into you know, one of the fifty categories, something like that. So standard data sets. Um, then there is another standard data set on Reddit where you classify um, posts into like top some top categories and these posts are linked through uh, through the person who wrote them. So basically the edge, is, edge between posts mean like it's written by the same person. So these are again like standard data. The Reddit is quite big already. And we thought like, okay, well, this is like, there is no privacy involved at all. I mean, not much, but is there something like which there could be privacy and it makes sense to, to work with this data to protect this privacy. And we found a very a brilliant, I mean, brilliant for researchers, like very bad for, <laughs> For the privacy or for the people, we found a beautiful data set from the you know early 2000, 2008 or 2009 on a um, social network uh, in Slovak, so in in, in, um, in the Slovak Republic. And for the adversary, this is like you know a holy grail of privacy information because these are anonymized. I mean, the data set is public. It's actually hosted on some Stanford website for uh, for graph data sets. What you have for each person is not their name, of course, obviously. But you have everything else you need to know about the people. So you have level of education, you have relation to smoking, alcohol, um, laugh, causal sex, marital status, children. I like watching free text. So people write basically what they do. It's it's crazy. So there's like I don't know, like three hundred thousand profiles there, and this linked. So I guess if you were the other area, wanna really you know find out who is there. I think you you could be able to link this to real people actually because there is so much information in there. So we were interested in classifying the nodes in this data set, but so people use this for classifying um, each node or each person um, into their age group. So you know for actually for mar you know for targeted marketing, which we found a little like unethical. So we said like let's do something super harmless. Uh, let's try to classify each person whether. Uh, they like, you know, which pets they like, whether they like dogs or whether they like cats. It's somehow like, it's boring, of course, but it doesn't, it doesn't hurt anyone, I hope. And still we try to protect all these other information. So, you know, in NLP, you have to encode your input somehow. So we, we use different models actually, because some of these data sets uh, on the citation networks, they came already with uh, back of words encoding. So we couldn't do anything about it. And for the, um, for the ready data set, it also came as a average word embeddings. I think they used GLOF and just average for you know everything in the in the database. For this, for the last one, the pockets, the the Slovak social site, um, we used the multilingual bird because it's like first it's in Slovak language while the others are in English, and second it's like the state of the art encoder. So we use just something out of shelf and we try different ones and just bird multiling would best like averaging the vectors. I'm skipping the baseline curves because this is not interesting. Uh, it's only interesting that you know in the baseline setup, Eden is better than SGD. So we're looking actually like you know we have SGD and we have Eden, and in Eden is just the, the tool of the choice in NLP task like out of box. It mostly works better, but it it's not the case for the differential private setup. So in differential private setup, Eden is actually pretty bad with the default hyperparameters, I have to say. So SGD works out of the box and SGD is actually like quite robust to the noise. So, you know, if we decrease, if we increase noise, the SGD DP for these graph networks is still super robust to adding noise. So this is this is a great news. I mean, it, it has to do something with how SGD works. Like, you know, there is no, no momentum and other stuff. So it just works brutally with the noise adding. And we don't have so much decrease in, in accuracy, unlike in Eden, 
this is great. So we could achieve, uh, again, we have like smaller epsilon is better privacy. And as I said, like, you know, SGDP works with even large noise, which is great. And Adam not. And we're interested like, okay, so what's, what's going on there? Because Adam should be working, you know, maybe better because in a in non-private setup, it's working well, it's working even better, but what's wrong with the private setup? But first, you know, the conclusion was, okay, we were able to, uh, to achieve some good privacy for epsilon of two, which is not bad. You know, if you remember uh, 1.1 from the randomized response, this is great. So the 90%, again, like some 10% roughly drop in performance, this is, this is okay, this is acceptable for epsilon of two. Unfortunately, there is some, there is some uh, properties of these graphs that basically you have to train them all at once. And it causes trouble to, um, to this implementation. So in TensorFlow or in, uh, in PyTorch, we, we use PyTorch here. These implementations, because you, can, you cannot go lower than epsilon of two. So there, it just didn't work because of the scale of the network. So we thought like, okay, um, one point, maybe the hyperparameters, they play a role. So we are burning more GPUs and we tried actually to hyper, you know, to do some hyperparameters on the Adam because maybe this, these are important. And we found something super interesting that um, Adam actually is better than SGDP, but it has to have like super large learning rates. And with these like, because I, I guess the default is 0 0.1. And if we like try with 20 up to 100 in some cases, we could get some gain. I guess the explanation for that is that basically it just jumps, you know, out of this local minimum, jumps quite a lot, and adds quite a lot. Of, you know, it can work with the noise by jumping far away in the space. But this is just a naive explanation. We don't we don't really know. But empirically, it works better with you know better fine tuning and larger learning rates, and it's even better than SGDP. And you know, we can achieve some good performance almost matching you know, like 90, 80 percent of the non-private. As I said, like the, the issue is also with uh, the full graph. So graph convolutional networks just take the, the whole graph at once and learn the whole structure. And it might be beneficial to do something about it. So maybe what if we just you know, cut the graphs into subgraphs randomly by which would won't reveal any more information. So we couldn't, we wouldn't be querying the data set and lose some privacy, but you just randomly cut the graph and learn them and treat them as as um, independently identically distributed data sets as we would have with uh, other data sets or images and they just learn you know in, in batches or small you know basically one example each time and there was some improvement for sgd for these uh, subgraphs but we also had uh, improvement for this atom with subgraphs so we could basically go better with performance but more importantly we can just push down the epsilons, the, the privacy budget up to one. So it's possible to achieve like stronger privacy with cutting these graphs and, and treating that as, um, as IID examples, still having like decent privacy. So I think this is kind of cool because it makes it usable for actually learning something on the graph data and not losing that much privacy while keeping some, you know, keeping the trade-off sort of balanced. So the lesson learned here is that we actually found like that the more complex representation works better. So if you have like you know uh, bird or uh, average word embeddings, it's definitely they do have the advantage for for learning better representation. And it works even better in differential privacy. And we also you know another question is like well for DP you need more data, and we did experiments quite a lot with adding more nodes to the graph. So basically, you know, growing the graph and whether it helps in the DDB setup. And it, it's, it does not. So more data does not necessarily help to learn better representation differential privacy here. What we found is that by cutting the graph into more subgraphs does help. So, you know, this should be the, the paradigm. It's not like just growing the graphs, but maybe having very many independent graphs or random cuts of the same big graph. <clears throat> And of course, hyperparameter optimization of Adam, it does have a huge impact here in the differential privacy setup, unlike in the standard setup. So you can tweak around with that, but here we got like very good values and it, it, it helped quite a lot. Great, so any questions to this graph setup? Uh, have you worked with GCNs as well? I would be interested. So I have here another question. Um... Well, uh, you said more complex, uh, more complex uh, training situations. Uh, 
work better with defensive privacy. But I, I find that I find that very weird because when you have a lot of parameters mm -hmm. and you have to clip a huge vector with oh, all those parameters, oh, yeah, yes. you, you're yeah. losing a lot of information because the norm should be small. And so yes, 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 yes. Goes, Yes, I see your point exactly. You, you are definitely right. I mean, the more parameters you have, the better, I mean, the worse it is because you have like huge sensitivity and you have to be clipping and stuff. This is correct. Uh, I, I, maybe it was misunderstanding. More complex representation of the data. So more complex, represent, you know, better representation of the input. So instead of using back of words, using maybe like average word embeddings or or um, output of the of the sentence bird or some bird with LSTM. So you can clip the data there as well. But basically, they are mostly, I guess, uh, I think at least from bird, they're coming between minus one and one. I mean, you can clip them definitely, and they they don't have necessarily like better um, bigger sensitivity, but they're just better represent the the true nature of the data. Does it make sense? Yeah, yeah. Thank All you. right, good. Thanks. Uh, uh, great, great point. Yeah. And I have another one. I I have seen that you use a uh, relu activate uh, relu activations between each well between each part if you go a few yes i i remember i had it slice back there is a small picture yeah there yeah uh, maybe here yeah, yeah there one yeah i can see that you are using relu and i have seen some publication done that indicate that using the activation known as hyperbolic tangent also mm -hmm. also helps the performance because oh yeah because yeah. the way in which uh, the gradients are distributed and so on okay nice um the point, yeah, that's a that's a great point. I mean, my answer would be <laughs> why why we didn't try that. Like, there was already so many parameters that we burned so much GPUs that we couldn't like. You know, we said like, okay, we take just you know vanilla implementation of GCN because I mean, you can go of course with the uh, other GNNs like uh, you know recurrent and you know you can really go crazy about this this graph networks. And we said like we take the GCN the vanilla one from the from the first papers of uh, well, I think like 2016, 17, 18, something like that. And we go with that and we won't change, you know, uh, we won't change activation functions, we won't change so many stuff because we were interested in only comparing under the same setup, comparing the non-privacy and, and privacy, not like aiming for you know, what is the best overall hyper, you know, hyperparameter configuration or network setup for the best privacy. That's a great point. I'll, I'll definitely have, uh, have a look into that. I mean, if you have a paper on that, it would be awesome to, to see as well. Yeah, great yeah, point. Thanks. I, I, can, I can look for the paper and I can send it to you. I awesome. Send it to me. In the in the chat. Awesome. Thank um, you very much. And thank you for the explanation. And I have one, one last more question that uh, also I have in the same paper, they say that if uh, that the, if the data is in balance, the impact of difference of privacy is way bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's, yeah, yeah, sure. Yeah, yes, yes. I mean, there's, so, uh, yeah. I, I don't know that in this kind of uh, the data set that you have, if, if this data set is balanced, because maybe, yeah, more, da more data can, Cannot uh, make the the data balanced, but maybe beginning with balanced da data can help. I, I think I think these data sets are like uh, pretty well balanced. At least I mean the social network we could we did balanced version of that because we exactly I mean there's a yeah this this paper like disparate impact on uh, on privacy with imbalanced yeah. classes exactly yeah we tried to get get balanced here uh, I think in some in some cases with the fifty class classification it was kind of like not really well balanced. Yeah, that's that's an important point. Exactly. I mean, we're yeah. This is something to look into, like class imbalance. Yeah. Uh, because in in the in fundamental learning, we have a lot of problems with that because sometimes uh, clients have a very <laughs> small <laughs> portion of data, and yeah. quite imbalanced, and their defense of privacy is terrible. Yeah, I can imagine. Yeah, I mean, like overall, even with all privacy, like having imbalanced data. So I'm working now in, uh, with uh, with legal people, with uh, legal researchers on some very different topic, like legal argument mining. And we have 85 classes, and just there is one class which has just one single instance in the data set. And it's like, Jesus, okay, it won't fly. Sorry about it. Yeah, okay, good. Um, so let me move on, and then I'll I'll just wrap up soon. So we're we're moving to the end. So where were we? Um. The point is, yeah, so I was talking about these hammers and nails, so standard tasks and graphs, kind of challenging, but you can, you know, figure out how to work with them. But some some things are just too big to, you know, just use SGDP out of box with TensorFlow and stuff like that. So for example, if you want to train your, uh, if you want to pre-train a BERT or some, you know, Roberta or some uh, language model from scratch using SGDP, 
it's 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 most likely going to fail just out of the box because it's just it just way too you know way, way too many iterations uh, way too hard to just use it out of box for the speed as well because the speed will play a role as i you know uh, as i said like earlier um if it's fine for fine tuning to go from i don't know like 5 minutes to 5 hours but you cannot go from one week of training bird pre training birds to 10 months of pre training birds so it doesn't fly so um i have a master student now ying and she's she's actually trying hard with these like going deeper into the implementations of these networks with pre-training, uh, pre-training BERT on, with differential privacy and what exactly, you know, what can you achieve with that? And what's the impact, you know, on some downstream task um, in the legal domain? But it's it's super challenging. And there's actually, there was one, I mean, if you're not Google, it's challenging. If you're Google, you have, you know, you have GPUs, you can just go crazy about it. But I remember like one, one email he told from, uh, from Omar Levy and his group, uh, how to train bird on academic budget and there's some tricks that you can employ and we're using some of these tricks and we're using other tricks like jacks you know implementations and it's very challenging to really make it work on large scale even though there's some papers out there who did it so but they were you know google so it's uh it's not fair comparison i would say so that brings me to the end uh, right on time and you know if all you have is emery everything likes a nail that's great so we have sggdp we have so many tasks you can treat everything as network and sometimes it works but sometimes it's not and you have to proceed with caution so having said that um uh thank you very much it's been a pleasure thanks for all these cool questions and suggestions so if uh, you know I'll, I'll be happy to uh, be in touch so drop me an email or you'll find it at trusthld.org so there's my email just drop me a line I'll, I'll love to stay in touch and you know get get no more people who are working on the same same topics because as we know privacy matters so thanks a lot Thanks a lot, Ivan. Uh, I hope now my micro is working. Yes, it is. Uh, great. I don't know what's my problem with Zoom, but anyway, thanks, uh, Ivan, and uh, thanks, uh, Danny, for these nice questions. Uh, I hope that, Ivan, if maybe, um, I don't know if Danny wants to make a, a stay in Darmstadt. I, I think that it could be a good. Um, a good plan for the future so anyway um anyone wants to make any more questions about how to apply defense of privacy to nlp or maybe lp to another tasks i know that there are people working on outlier detection uh computer vision the image classification okay so uh, go ahead okay and um, make any question about this new new topic okay it's not new but now in artificial intelligence it's a little bit new okay so go ahead so before you think of any questions if you work in these topics um i would love to see you sign up for acl reviews as well as i mean Ehonio told me like he has some papers to, okay. to take care of i have i have now three i guess three papers with differential privacy and some people are leaving you know leaving the ship saying like i don't know i don't i don't want to review these papers i have no idea so if you do have an idea so just drop me a line i'll be super happy to you know maybe assign one paper of these reviews because if you you know the point is it, it might be it's 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 alien to nlp folks uh, you know all these different privacy stuff and and privacy in general and if you want the papers to get a proper review, some you know you, you need to have some expertise in that. So if you feel like volunteering, just drop me a line. I'd be super happy to have you on okay, board. My, I don't know if uh, Danny is uh, Danny. Do you want to make a review? <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe stop recording and then you know off record we can. <laughs> we can <make> okay. Yeah. <laughs> But anyway, okay, Danny, Danny is uh, now it's uh, our expert in, okay, he's starting his PhD in, in difference of privacy, um, specifically more in how to protect machine learning uh, to adversarial attacks. So I guess that in the future we will make some NLP application. That's great. And uh, now he's the, 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 our guy, our difference of privacy guy. So, okay, it's, um, uh, okay, you know, the guy, Nice. <laughs> that, that you can invite, okay? Nice, nice. Um, so I have a question, okay, be, because I, I see that you are starting working on how to apply uh, defense of privacy, okay, uh, in NLP task. But are you 
thinking okay of planning to uh to go ahead okay to go ahead with the federated learning on how to protect so because here we are working more in protect the, the learning process from the adversarial attacks mm -hmm. and i see that you are working more in how to protect the privacy okay mm -hmm. not thinking about how uh, an additional guy can uh, corrupt the learning the, the learning so right I don't yes now if you you also have any plan to to, to also to mix so okay nlp differential privacy with all the learning paradigms like of the learning and also how to think how to protect nlp system for uh, from adversarial attacks yeah that's a, that's a great topic and i, I i've seen people doing that exactly like combining for learning homomorphic encryption and all these you know cryptography tools or other tools for combining with privacy so definitely I'm, I'm not aiming on that right now because for for one one reason because we have this beautiful framework of differential i mean beautiful we have this framework of differential privacy just making its way to a new field and we yeah. do actually in an nlp like data matters that's the problem like privacy of data matters so if you if you ever work with some company they say like i don't give you my data and and so on and I think there's like a huge opportunity, if it if it works, we don't know, maybe it's just, you know, it's irrealistic, but huge opportunity to make it work. Like if you, for example, I'm interested quite a lot in, in data sharing. So for example, local differential privacy, the randomized response we had was local differential privacy. You give me your data, you give me your, I cheated or I didn't cheat. You can give it to anyone and they will never ever be able to figure out what you truly did. Even with quantum computers, nothing will break it. Your privacy will be there protected forever. Now imagine you can do this with your data set. So I can share my data set of, I don't know, like patient records or uh, scientific reviews with differential privacy. Yeah. And it will have some you know, use for anyone else without revealing anything on the individual. And I think there's a, you know, somebody, somebody has to do it. Somebody has to ex explore these parts. And I think it's super interesting. Like, you know, is it possible on text? Because text has a super big sensitivity in terms of like options. It's not just, you know, exponential blow. And and this is one one direction. So I'm not I'm not aiming like in combining these systems yet. I mean, there's a value on that, and there's there's definitely a value if you're obliged to do, for example, you know, with your partners. But I'm really you know down to earth. You know, how can you make it work? For example, rewriting a text. Can you make a difference for private? Nobody knows. Yeah. No. Yes. Uh, I guess that that it's. Um... Uh, a new requirement for for for, for our research okay to work in this kind of um, how to protect uh, artificial intelligence systems uh, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and the privacy of of data because at the end okay as you said uh, NLP is uh, needs data uh, we need a lot of data and at the end with personal data so yeah. um, data from our devices data that we generate about uh, what several our personal topics so at the end. Exactly, exactly. So, um, but 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 let me ask a question. So, if if you were with these, uh, you know, learning scenarios like federated learning and things like that, so, um, are you? Um, do you have like any particular attack in mind? So, is it like more more like network setup, like really distributed setup with federated learning, or is it more like just the paradigm and uh, locally and then? You know, I'm just wondering, like, for the actual use cases, whether somebody is using federated learning, for example, on a on a real scale, like from from devices to some central system, ah, because uh, I have no idea. Uh, actually, you can you can think in a hospital, okay? Uh, if you if you process health records, okay, you can say imagine all the hospital of German, German hospitals, okay, okay. <laughs> with health records. I see, I see. All right. So in health records, you can make a uh, name entity recognition to become uh, question answering uh, the uh okay at the end okay argumentation mining because uh, uh physicians can make some okay, can write some arguments about okay the uh the dc uh so any hospital want to serve with you okay or, mm -hmm. or um uh this health records and okay with federated learning you can combine all the health records okay right yeah okay okay or 
uh, imagine if we go, okay, now Jose is here that he works in translingual NLP. So if we, we can make a translingual, a German hospital and a Spanish hospitals, okay? I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's, it's, we are now starting an artificial intelligence that go beyond, okay, our small data sets. Um, yeah, it's nice, uh, but at the same time, it's difficult because, yeah. We have to think in private, how to protect privacy, mm -hmm. and how to protect our AI system from adversarial attacks. Uh, there are a lot of variables that we have to take into account. So yeah. It sounds but challenging. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it sounds nice. <laughs> so thanks, Ivan. I don't know if there are uh, any more people that wants to make questions. If you do, just send me an email and I'll be I'll be yes, super happy to uh, be in touch and free, answer. Okay, feel free to write to Ivan. Uh, he's a nice guy. He will uh, answer you. So, uh, <laughs> so feel free. Thanks, Ivan, for your uh, talk. Uh, I hope to keep in contact. Thank you very much, Eugenio. Thanks everybody here in the in the audience for your questions, uh, for a chat, and I'll be happy to stay in touch. And wish you good luck and good success uh, with everything you do. So thanks a lot. Bye bye. Bye bye. Thank you. Thank you.